So hello and welcome to another children's language development video with me Paul from the QE. This one is about development in children's grammar. So we're talking about growth in children's morphology and syntax. And you may first of all ask the question, well, when do children start using English grammar? When is their first evidence that they are understanding about grammar? Well, the answer to that is probably around about a year and a half. Because at around 18 months, children start to use two words in conjunction. This is the famous two-word stage. And when they do this, then what they're showing is an understanding about syntax because they're choosing to put one word in front of the other and therefore showing an understanding about standard English syntactical structures. Now, here are some typical combinations in this two-word stage. We've got baby crying, so subject, verb. We've got catch ball, right, verb plus object. We've got daddy dinner, subject plus object. And we've got dolly dirty, that's subject plus complement. So you can see there, certainly in the top three there, that this, this shows an understanding about SVO, subject, verb, object. Those sort of predictable patterns that you get in English syntax, SVO. OK, so uh, there has been some research done uh, by other researchers about this. Uh, Roger Brown, 1973, did a longitudinal study and he focused on three American kids and their grammatical development. And he was looking at the syntactical structures to see if there were actually a limited range of patterns. And of course, he discovered that there were. So his data seems to suggest that there, habitually there are sort of eight combinations of two word utterances at this stage uh, when children are, you know, a year and a half and two years old. And here they are. So agent plus action. Agent here means subject of the sentence. It doesn't mean like special agent. Agent plus action as an, an example like daddy go or action plus object like make cake. Agent plus object Billy Bike. So your top three that again are demonstrating syntactical awareness of the SVO construction of normal English sentences. Then you've got other ones like action plus location, run garden. You've got object plus location, as in teddy chair. We have a possessor and possession, like granny gloves. We have object plus attribute, which means a description, like coat, soft. And then we've got demonstrative plus object, as in here, chair. So a limited range of patterns. It's well worth your while remembering those because in the exam, the AQA exam, you get a little clump of data. So if you're detecting that this child is a year and a half, two years old, and predominantly it's two word utterances that they're working with, it may well be that they fall into these patterns. They're not just random, and therefore it shows that children are perhaps not just repeating and imitating things around them, but they have this innate capacity to unlock the secrets grammatically of the language. There are some examples of transcripts in the textbook, which you could uh, have a look at. Uh, so we've got Lauren, the child saying, sit down. And the mum saying, you want me to sit down like that. So Lauren was obviously using very direct regulatory language there. So she's got a bit to learn in terms of negative face and politeness features. But you could say that that kind of uh, uh, chimes in, it aligns with um, Roger Brown's two word utterances, because isn't it action plus location? Sit down, action plus location. So you could say that there is definitely a pattern going on there. Mum says, can you draw me a smiley face with eyes? And Lauren just says, two eyes. Now, this is difficult. Obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a transcript and we don't know the paralinguistic and prosodic features. We don't know the situation that's going on. So why is Lauren saying two eyes? We don't know. But here, Lauren is using a determiner. So two is a determiner. So we've got a determiner plus the object. So that doesn't seem to necessarily fit in with Roger Brown's cases. And then we've got a third example where mum says, what else did you do or do you do at uh, mother's... Uh, let's go back. I've lost it. What else did you do at um, your friend's house? Let me just make that smaller. And Lauren says, making painting. 
like that making painting. So there's a good example of action plus object. Okay, so there is some supporting evidence to support this idea that at this two-word utterance stage, children habitually seem to be following the syntactical standard structures of English. We then move into the telegraphic stage. Now, why is this called the telegraphic stage? Well, it's all about sending telegrams, isn't it? In the good old days, pre-mobile um, phones and uh, telephones, how did you communicate across vast distances? Well, you sent telegrams. So telegrams were your means of communication. And of course, you had to keep your messages elliptical. The longer your telegram, the more expensive that it was going to be. So keep your messages short in a telegram. And this is what children are doing at this stage, at three years old. They tend to be in this telegraphic stage where they're using these three or four word combinations. And they tend to, put, to miss out grammatical words. And they tend to use instead so-called content words. So I'm talking about kind of like verbs and nouns and adjectives, all of those lexical items that have some kind of semantic value and missing out things like prepositions and connectives and sometimes determiners, you know, the, the secondary important words. So here we've got a bunch of words and would you say each of these words is a content word or a grammatical word? You might want to stop the video and do that little exercise. Okay, so if we're looking at for uh, content words, surely they tend to be the verbs and the adjectives and the nouns. So hat, run, hop, juice, sun, mummy, goes, hot, happy, seat. They're those sorts of words, aren't they? Those are the content words. And the words which are omitted are your grammatical words, words like uh, is as a primary auxiliary verb or on as a preposition or a which is a determiner, it's an indefinite article, or in, another preposition, or maybe even the use of the pronouns like we and they, or the definite article, the. Okay, so in the telegraphic stage, it tends to be content words which are used at the expense of grammatical words. And of course, there are common telegraphic combinations. So you've got subject, verb, complement, and that's complement, meaning kind of like an adjective, not a compliment, as in, ooh, I like your shirt. So doggy is naughty, that's subject, verb, complement. You've got Jody want cup, as in subject, verb, object. And you've got give mummy spoon, so verb plus object plus another object. Okay, so as I said, content words, lexical words, rather than grammatical words. Now, Chomsky comes along and says, look, children have got this innate capacity to unlock the secrets of English grammar. All you need to do is expose a child to language around them, and they're going to pick up those structures. So how could we possibly test this in an experiment? The answer is through our little friend here. This is a WUG. And I'm now going to introduce to you Jean Burko's famous 1958 WUG test. Are you ready to do the WUG test? Get a pen and a piece of paper and write down the answers to the following 10 questions. Number one, this is a WUG. Number <clears throat> now, there is another one. There are two of them. There are two. Number two, this is a gutch. Now there's another one. There are two of them. There are two. This dog has quirks on him. That dog has more quirks on him. That dog is... Number four. And this dog has even more quirks on him. This dog is the... This is a man who knows how to rick. By God, yes, he's ricking. Uh, he did the same yesterday. What did he do yesterday? Yesterday, he... Ha, it's a Turkish wug. This is a wug who owns a hat. It's a fez. Whose hat is it? 
It is the hat. Number seven. This is a man who knows how to luge. He's luging. He does it every day. Every day he... Number eight, uh, what would you call a man whose job is to zib? A, a what? Number nine, this is a man who knows how to zib. What's he doing? He is. And then finally, ah, oh, it's a very tiny wug. So what would you call a teeny little wug like this? A a what right now presumably you've got answers like this so plural of wug would be wugs plural of gutch would be gutches uh, comparative adjective quirkier superlative adjective quirkiest past tense material verb ricked wugs possessive you know it belongs to the wug luges so that's a present simple verb. Luges. Zibber. A person who zibs. A zibber. A person who is zibbing. I-N-G. And then finally, this little baby wug. What is it? Is it a wuglet? Is it a wuggling? Is it a baby wug? What have you got? Right. And you... on. Uh, YouTube, you can see various videos of children uh, doing the WUG test and uh, Burko talking about the WUG test. This is she, Jean Burko Gleason. So this was created in 1958 to test this notion that children have a more sophisticated understanding of grammar than they have been explicitly taught. So she uses pseudo words words like wug and the reason why she's doing that is she needs to ensure that the child has never been exposed to the word previously if she just used normal words then you could say well the child has just remembered this from memory all they're doing is is imitating here are the stats 76 percent of four-year-olds were able to deduce what the plural of the noun wug was and in fact 76 percent was able to do the answers to the sorts of things that you were doing in the rest of the quiz as well so a very healthy proportion. So the results seem to suggest that, yes, children do have this ability to understand grammatical rules and that they can transfer them to other examples that they've never heard before. So all in all, the WUG test in this form certainly supports Chomsky's nativist theory that children are born with this language acquisition device which enables them to work out innately the structures of the language okay now here's another study done by the famous roger brown he of the two word utterances he was busy in 1973 because what he did was he suggested that children at this stage from 20 to 36 months learn inflections in a certain order ha so it's not just random again children are not just copying what they're hearing around them but there are certain predictable stages that children are going through in using inflections and here is his magical list so if we look at the first three here so these are the sorts of inflectional grammatical endings that children are developing earlier on so they're putting ing on the end of a verb to make it a, pro a progressive, I go in garden. They're sticking an S plural inflection on the end of a concrete noun like cup in order to make it into a plural. And they're doing an S on the end of uh, a noun to denote possessive as well as in Teddy's chair. So these are three of the earliest inflections that Brown is suggesting that children do. You then, as time moves on, get children who start to include these grammar words, articles, like at and an, both of which are indefinite articles, and the, which is the definite article, and start using things like the past tense ed form, as in I kicked it. And then ultimately, as you're creeping towards sort of three years old, children start doing things like the third person 
singular uh, verb ending, the present simple ending, like she loves me, yeah, 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 putting the S on the end of love. That's the third person present simple verb ending. And also doing things with auxiliary verbs, as in it is raining, it's raining. So the is there bit is the auxiliary verb. So those come later on, presumably because they're not absolutely central to meaning, are they? You could still say it raining and it'd be perfectly understandable about what it means. So the point is that these inflections are learned in a predictable way through certain stages and they're not just random. And therefore that is good evidence, I suppose, of the nativist idea. So uh, Katamba found actually that there was very little connection between the frequency with which inflections are used by parents and the order in which children acquire them. Because if you look at adult speech, a and the, those articles, they are used most frequently and the ed past tense is used least frequently, but actually they're fourth and fifth in terms of acquisition. So what that suggests is that imitation doesn't have a strong influence on how children acquire inflections. And what about the progressive ING inflection, which is acquired the earliest, uh, probably because it's most often used in the present tense and the child will relate more to things happening now than in the past or the future. So it's sort of deetical and it's reflecting things that are happening in the here and now. So that's interesting research done by Katamba. We then have Kruttenden, some of these researchers have fabulous names. It sounds like some kind of posh biscuit, doesn't it? Morty Cruttenden. Cruttenden has three stages of acquiring inflections. And this is interesting because, again, it shows that we're going through predictable stages. Stage one is inconsistent usage. So a child will use an inflection correctly some of the time but this is because they've learnt the word or maybe they're just copying. So they haven't absorbed the grammatical rule. They might say, I play outside one day and then I played outside the next. So it's not consistent. You then move into stage two where you get some consistent usage, but actually sometimes it's non-standard, i.e. you get virtuous errors. So for example, the child might apply the regular past tense inflection ED to all sorts of irregular verbs. So a child might say something like, I dwinked it rather than I drank it. So you've got that kind of creative overgeneralization, which is perfectly logical, but it just happens to be non-standard. And then, alleluia, we move into the third stage where we get this consistent usage when the child is able to cope with irregular forms successfully. They're saying mice rather than mouses. So they're not saying the Steinbeck novel of mouses and men. They're saying of mice and men. OK, so according to Cruttenden, children move steadily through these three predictable stages of acquiring inflections. OK, so you've got research that I've done from Brown. You've done uh, research from Katumba, And here you've got Cruttenden as well. Now let's hone in on some particular words and see how they develop grammatically over time. And let's start with pronouns, which of course are tricky for children because they are completely deetical. Your pronouns depend upon the situation that the person is talking in. We have a researcher called Belugi, Ursula Belugi, who back in the 1970s, a lot of this research is absolutely ancient. So back in the 1970s, characterize the development of pronoun acquisition in terms of complexity. And she reckoned there were basically three stages in the child, you know, acquiring usage of pronouns. First of all, basically the child doesn't use a pronoun, they just nominalize. So the child uses a name rather than a pronoun. In the second stage, the child will recognize that there are pronouns but they will not be able to differentiate between subject and object pronouns. Subject pronoun I, object pronoun me. Subject pronoun we, object pronoun us. So the child will not necessarily be able to differentiate between the subject and the object form. And then in the third stage, you get the child 
who is beginning to use the subject and the object forms in a standard way. Now notice, no parent will ever teach the child about the difference between a subject and an object pronoun. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find many adults who could really tell you the difference between they and them. Okay, so have a look at these five utterances and decide which stage of pronoun acquisition you think, according to Ursula Bellucci, the child is likely to be in. So A, surely mean, no, like it. Surely that's your second stage because in standard English it would be I don't like it. So the child here is using the first person singular object rather than subject form of the pronoun. I do it, well, although it's a bit a little bit telegraphic and basic, surely the pronouns there are on completely standard forms. So that would be the third stage. Matthew do it. Now we're assuming here it's Matthew who is speaking, in which case that's surely stage one. So the child is nominalizing, they're saying their own name. I don't want to see them. We're going to holiday. Okay, so again, we've got... Uh, perfectly standard uses of pronouns there, both in D and E, so surely we're in the third stage. So it's always a good idea to hone in on the, uh, the success or otherwise of children's ability to use pronouns in a standard way and to apply Ursula Bellucci's uh, research on that. Then we think about negating sentences, which isn't easy, is it? you know, taking a positive sentence and then turning it into a negative. And Ursula Bellucci also seemed to identify that there were three stages in this as well, that when a child is wanting to negate a sentence, first of all, all they do in the first stage is they get your negative adverb like no or not, and they just whap it onto the start of the utterance. Simple. Then in the second stage, the negative word moves into the body of the utterance. And then finally, in the third stage, the child attaches negatives to auxiliary verbs in a standard kind of way. So again, like on the last slide, what do you think on these, on these 10 ones here? Which stage of Ursula Bellucci's uh, stages do you think that they've reached? Okay, so A looks pretty standard to me because you've got the child there attaching negatives to the auxiliary verb, we are not going. Whereas on B, that seems to be stage one, doesn't it? We've just got the negative word that's been lopped onto the front of the utterance. I can't do it! Something I often feel when I'm about to make one of these videos. That's a stage three, isn't it? In terms of negating the sentence. Not happy would be stage one. Whereas E, me not very happy, surely that's stage two. So we've got that negating adverb that's going into the middle of the sentence but we haven't got a, a kind of auxiliary verb that goes with it. So F would be stage one, G would be stage three, H would be stage three, I would be stage one, and J would be stage two. Okay, so useful research there, again, from Ursula Bellucci, who's our superstar in terms of language uh, grammar, children's grammar. And what about questions? They are also tricky elements to do. Now, here's a, a task for you. Categorize all of these questions into four different stages of development. Which do you think come earlier? Which come in the middle? And which come later on? Go on, have a go. Well, you won't be surprised to hear that there are predictable stages that children go through in terms of question formation as well. And guess who's given us that research? Yes, it's our Ursula again. So these are four stages, according to Bellucci, in question formation in children's language. Now, first of all, you've got rising intonation. Uh, and this actually can happen in the holophrastic stage. So there's plenty of evidence to suggest that even at this very basic stage, when children are just saying single words, that actually they're doing things with their prosodic features in order to indicate meaning. In this case, to be asking a question bedtime like that so stage one is rising intonation which i suppose also might link in with the idea of behaviorism that children are imitating adults they're imitating the intonation patterns of adults 
So stage two would be inversion of auxiliary verbs because that's one way, a simple way that we do to ask a question. We just do a bit of monkey business with the words themselves within the question and we just mix them around. So we've got inversion going on. So you are going, which is a declarative, becomes are you going as an interrogative. Okay, so in stage two, the children child might be starting to do that to invert auxiliary verbs. We then move into the third stage, the use of interrogative pronouns. So this is who, what, where, when, why, etc. Okay, and children tend to do this in uh, Jean Piaget's pre-operational stage. So from the age of two to six, they're constantly asking blooming questions, aren't they? So interrogative pronouns are going to be a feature in this third stage. And in the fourth stage, you might get tag questions. So these are statements, these are declaratives in which you've got a question form tagged onto the end. You like going to the park, don't you? Okay, so these are worth memorizing Baluj's stages of question formation. And what you could do is that you could go back to those ones there and see which of the stages you think that they most adhere to. For example, see whole, that's clearly going to be stage one, whereas why you smiling would be stage three because it's using an interrogative pronoun. Whereas why not me drink it would be moving towards stage three and stage four. OK, question formation. So there's a lot of research done there by Ursula Bellucci about negation, about pronouns and about questions, which is well worth remembering. OK, so you could put all of that stuff together, all that you've learned about the emergence in children's grammar by looking at some data. Here is some data that I've just taken from one of the textbooks. This is a single child and they've taken utterances from that child. And it's quite interesting looking at their development in language over time, moving from your very basic telegraphic speech where a child is saying the determiner dat like that and pointing at a cup so they could be labeling or they could be using instrumental or regulatory language there to say basically can you pass me that cup so very basic single utterances like dat and horsey and then moving into me want one like that where you're going to be commenting on the telegraphic nature of the language that's going on and the fact that you've got that non-standard first person object rather than subject form of the pronoun and therefore that would place it in Ursula Belugi's second stage in terms of pronouns. So what you could do is you could go through those particular utterances and you could practice using the sorts of knowledge that we've been talking about so far. Okay, thank you very much and in our next CLD video we will be putting the fun into phonology.